me begin with a uh, the word of prayer. Dearly mm-hmm. um, Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, I uh, thank you for this uh, nice weather we have, and I uh, just pray that you be glorified in what we do. Uh, in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, um, let me just remind you what we're up to. We're looking at the complexification as a means to um, really understanding the structure of um, mappings on a real vector space, primarily a finite dimension, I suppose. And um, so we defined last time that um, given you know, V, uh, a real vector space, right? Um, that the complexification has basically the form x plus i y such that x and y are ordinary vectors, right? And so we explained how to define complex scalar multiplication on this space. And um, then we also defined for, for t a real linear transformation, right, from v to v real linear transformation, we defined the complexification T sub C to be a mapping from, well, V sub C to V sub C, right? Where, um, given by what? Uh, T sub C of X plus I Y equals to T of X, oh, my bad, me. Given by T of X, T sub C, I'll get it eventually here, guys. T sub C of X plus I Y equals to T of X plus I T of Y. So that's how we define the complexification of T. And then furthermore, um, we defined that uh, if um, T sub C of V is equal to lambda V, for say um, some lambda in the complex numbers and um, v not equal to zero, then v is complex eigenvector for t with uh, with obviously complex eigenvalue lambda, right? And um, so it, it is an honest-to-goodness eigenvector for the complexification, right? But technically speaking, it's not an eigenvector for the original map, right? So, um, however, you might notice that um, we also had that theorem, right? That V equals to the span of beta, real span, I'll, I'll put an R here because it's kind of relevant. So sometimes we adorn the span with the type of coefficients we're using, right? So if V is the span, the real span of beta, then um, the complexification of C we can also write as the complex span of the same set beta. So every basis for the real vector space can also be thought of as a complex basis for the complexification of the vector space. And this has important logical import for us because this means that the, um, we can on the one hand look at the matrix of T with respect to the basis beta, right? And we can compare that to the matrix of T sub C with respect to the basis beta. But over here in the complex sense and over there in the real sense, but the, the, what's the story? They're the same matrix right? But T beta beta is literally equal to the complexification of T beta beta. So what's this mean? The characteristic polynomial of T with respect to say variable S is going to be equal to the characteristic polynomial of T sub C with respect to variable S. 
like they share the same characteristic polynomial because they share the same matrix, right? You can prove that characteristic polynomials are equal for similar matrices. So this is, there's no loss of generality of pointing out that these two matrices are equal. Like it's still going to be true that the characteristic polynomial is what it is for any other choice of matrix, right? Um, that's a homework exercise I should have assigned if I didn't. Um, there's still time. I'll shut up. But um, any questions so far? So what this all means is that if you find the eigenvalues for your matrix, for your given real transformation, you've already found the eigenvalues for the complexification just the same. So that's, that's pretty neat. <laughs> the other thing we had was that for T, an element of the linear transformations on the real vector space, and um, you know, T of V equals to lambda V um, for, um, and I guess I should put sub C here, um, you know, V not equal to zero and lambda in the, uh, let's say equals to alpha plus I beta in C, uh, we have, uh, well, I guess I should also say, let me, let me say V is equal to A plus IB as well, all right? Where A and B are real vectors, we can do that, yep. Um, well, we define lambda bar, so the guys, sometimes I use lambda bar, sometimes I use star, stars and bars, conjugate anyway, um, alpha minus I beta, that's the complex conjugate. And likewise, the complex conjugate of V, which I'll also call V star. You know, who uses stars, who uses bars, I forget, but one, one convention is popular in physics, the other is more popular in math, but you'll see both, okay? Complex conjugate. I'll let you use either. Woo now, um, but you do need to use one, I mean, you do need to be aware of what it means, I mean, definitely. So um, then here's the conclusion, um, T sub C of the conjugate is equal to lambda conjugate V conjugate, right? In other words, for a real linear transformation, complex eigenvectors always come in conjugate pairs, right? So you have, you have V, let me just write it as a pair. You have V with lambda and complex conjugation gives you V conjugate la with eigenvalue lambda conjugate, right? And we have a, we have a, we have a more, more, more than that, more than this, if beta is not equal to zero, then V and V conjugate are linearly independent, right? Because if beta is not equal to zero, that means that lambda star is not equal to lambda. Therefore, they're distinct. But we know that eigenvalues with this, eigenvectors with distinct eigenvalues are linearly independent, right? Okay. So now that we have all this, um, let me get us to the next proposition here. So proposition 5.7.9 says if A in, <laughs> these are all supposed to be square guys, our n by n has um, lambda equals to alpha plus I beta, a complex eigenvalue, um, such that beta not equal to zero, and eigenvector V equals to A plus IB, that would be an element of like CN, all right, with A and B in RN, all right, then A is not equal to zero and B is not, and I think I argued this last time as well, but um, we need to go through it again because the calculations here matter, all right? So actually, instead of A, well, Mm. 
So I'm, I'm debating whether or not I want to switch this over to like a theorem about linear operators instead. Um, tell you, we'll, let's start with this and then we'll see if we can convert it over to a, a theorem about linear transformations, you know. Um, all right. Well, yeah, let me just get straight to, the, we, we approved this last time actually. Let me, I'm going to bail on this because we did this already. It's not really the point. The next one was the next thing I, pro I perhaps should prove, which is Proposition 5.10, um, which said that A and B are actually a linearly independent set of real vectors. So <coughs> same data, um, but instead of A not equal to zero, then, um, you know, a comma B linearly independent. I guess if you have this theorem, if you have this proposition, then you automatically get the previous one, right? Because it can't be zero and be linearly independent, you know? All right, so the, the proof is a little bit sneaky. Let's look at it. This one I get stuck on sometimes, but you guys won't. Let's see here. So. We have, um, let's just write, let's write what we got in front of us. We've got V is A plus IB, and we've got V uh, conjugate is A minus IB, right? Mm -hmm. By the assumptions of the theorem. Um, and um, so if I subtract or add these, I get things, right? So, so if I add them, I get V plus V conjugate is 2A, right? And if I subtract them, I get V minus V conjugate is 2IB, right? You might recognize these calculations from like the uh, imaginary exponential stuff. It's very similar. So this all tells me that um, uh, let's see here. So thus A is equal to one half of V plus V conjugate, right? And B is equal to one over two I of V minus V conjugate, right? Great. We're trying to prove that A and B are linearly independent. Let's do it. So how should we do that? I mean, there's various, <laughs> you're like, take the wedge product. No, no, I won't do that. Um, oh, it's kind of tempting. Uh, I'm going to do this. C1 is rather an imaginative. C1A plus C2B equals to zero for C1 and C2 where? What kind of linear independence am I claiming for A and B? Real. Real, right. So... <clears throat> Uh, let's see here. So that is C1 times, so well, C1 over 2 times V plus V conjugate, right? Um, plus C2 over 2I, um, V minus V conjugate equals to 0. But we know that V and V conjugate are linearly independent because they're eigenvectors with distinct eigenvalues, as we discussed just a second ago, right? So if I rewrite this as, say, one half, um, you know, C1 over 2 um, plus C2 over 2i, V plus C1 over 2 minus C2 over 2i, V conjugate equal to 0, I can then equate both of the coefficients there to zero because we know that V and V star are linearly independent, right, as complex vectors. We're getting real independence from the complex linear independence of the conjugate eigenvectors, yeah. So this implies that, you know, C1 um, over 2 plus C2 over 2i is equal to zero and C1 over 2 minus C2 over 2i is equal to 0. But 
that of course implies C1 equals to C2 equals to zero, right? So you lose 20% of the credit on the Math 200 test right here for the lack of detail going from here to here. Like I definitely will get you for about 20% right there. But on the other hand, this is, you know, not much of, well, anyway, I shut up. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I feel your pain. So, <laughs> but I'll be, I'll be causing the pain next semester. So anyway, um, so there you go. Yeah. Now, what's up next? Well, so that means that A and B are, um, you know, uh, linearly independent vectors, right? And by the way, this likewise, so like likewise, um, you know, if you had, you know, Vj is equal to Aj plus Ibj for distinct um, lambda j equals to alpha j plus i beta j, beta j not equal to zero for all j, right? Then a1, uh, a1d1, a2b2, uh, however many there are, what, what, do we, what do we want to say? j equals what? One to say k? So a1, a1, b1, a2, b2, all the way out to a k comma b k is linearly independent, right? The proof of this is nearly identical to what I just went through for a single eigenvector, right? Because you can repeat these arguments at each, for each eigenvector basically. And you have the, all the coefficients are vanishing, assuming that the complex eigenvectors values are distinct. So almost the same proof gives you this. All right. Okay. Um, I find it much more interesting to look at this with respect to a linear transformation. So let me get over to that. Like we could, we could convert what we just did into information about how the matrix similarity transforms, but um, I'm just going to go ahead and skip over to I've got a bunch of examples in the notes of actual, you know, numerical problems with complex eigenvectors and such, and even commentary about like issues with numerical um, subtleties. But eventually, I get to section 5.9, which is where I want to be, which is the real Jordan form, and there we find the following theorem. And here it is: if V is Uh, two two dimensional um, real vector space and T going from V to V is a linear transformation with complex eigenvalue lambda equals to alpha plus I beta with beta not equal to zero, all right, and a complex eigenvector v equals to a plus ib, um, of course, which is an element of vc, right? And um, here, just to beat a dead horse, a and b are elements of v, right? And I mean, I haven't written it up here, but I am assuming, of course, that alpha and beta are um, real values here, right? So in the complex class, we make an agreement that whenever we write z equals x plus i y, it will be understood that x and y are real. In the interest of not announcing x and y are real a thousand times in the course, maybe I should introduce that custom here as well. In the, in the context of the complexification, when I write a formula, like this, right, or like that. Let it be understood that A and B are real, alpha and beta are real. 
if I want such an expression to allow for those to be complex, I must announce such. All right. Anyway, if that's the deal, then what's the matrix? Then um, if gamma is the matrix formed by taking the real and the imaginary part of the complex eigenvector, um, then the matrix of T with respect to the gamma basis is simply alpha, beta, minus beta, alpha. So let's, let's prove that. It's not much to prove, right? Like, all right, so we have, we're assuming that T of A plus I B is equal to alpha plus I beta. Okay, alpha plus I beta times A plus I B Right, because that's T of V equals to lambda V, <coughs> but work it out. <coughs> this means that T of A plus I times T of V. Now, my, my bad guys, what, have I, what am I missing here? I only take off like 30% of your credit if you make this mistake on the test, right? So, all right. I'm, I'm mostly joking. It would just be like 20%. So, um, I'm sorry, is it too soon? Let's see here. So, that would be alpha A. Notice I times I is minus 1, so minus beta B plus I times, well, alpha A. My bad. Alpha B. Let me do it this way, other way around. Beta B, beta A. I'll get it eventually. Beta A plus alpha B. You might just calculate it for yourself. It'd be faster. Right? So what does this all mean? T of A equals alpha of A minus beta B. Right. This is that. And this right here is that. So thus, the matrix of T with respect to the gamma is of course the matrix, well it's T of the first thing in the basis with respect to the gamma and then T acting on the second thing in the basis with the gamma, which of course is alpha A plus, oh excuse me, minus uh, beta B, gamma coordinate to that, and then uh, beta A plus alpha B, gamma coordinate to that, which by definition of gamma coordinates you got yourself a alpha minus beta and a beta and an alpha. There you go. Which is slightly opposite of what I usually like to write for these things, right? I usually like to put the minus up here, don't I? I mean, that's not this, you know? But I usually like to put the minus up there because of the interpretation of the regular representation as it connects to left multiplication on the complex numbers. If you've done the, um, the bonus project, you know what I'm talking about a little bit. Um, a certain purple student was suggesting that I, that I make the bonus project do the next class. Is that, no? Yeah, didn't you say that? No. You said I shouldn't do that. Okay. All right. And I should also not talk about this in class, right? Is this also true? No? Okay, just checking. <laughs> All right. Now, there's <laughs> no question. Is this matrix diagonalizable? I mean, is this transformation diagonalizable? No. Well, excuse me. Which one are you talking about? Because my question was, I just said this transformation. But there's two choices here, aren't there? 
right? One of those, you're right. One of those, you're wrong. So what I'm trying to say is this guy is diagonalizable, right? This one, T, is not diagonalizable. Now, T is diagonalizable because if I take the delta basis, I can get myself alpha plus I beta, alpha minus I beta, right? What's my basis? What do I choose for delta? Just what? I just use the eigenvector and the conjugate eigenvector, right? The complexification is a two complex dimensional space. That's a basis because those are linearly independent in the complex sense. And as such, it's diagonalizable. Here's the proof. See? Diagonal. On the other hand, it's impossible to diagonalize T in the real sense. All right? Because why? Because the characteristic polynomial of T is what? You know, I'll use S. It's, you know, S minus alpha squared plus beta squared, right? Which is not equal to zero for any real S. There are no zeros. It is not split. All of the zeros are outside of the scope of the real numbers. T is not diagonalizable. However, it does have a real Jordan form. This right here is the so-called real Jordan form. So real Jordan form is what we mean by, what we mean by that is we, we take the complexification, we find the Jordan basis for the complexification, and then we, what we're going to do is we're going to use the real and imaginary parts of the, the complexification's Jordan basis to build a corresponding real basis. And when we do that, the matrix which results for the, uh, the original real transformation is called the real Jordan form. And I, I forget my notation for this. I think it's like, I have some notation in the notes. I'm trying, I'm, I'll, try to st I'll try not to change my notation yet again this semester. Um, it's hard to find this stuff in books, which is unfortunate. Um, so this, I, I call this R2, two, for two by two block, okay, of alpha plus I beta. All right. So what would the, what would the next thing be in this, this story? What if we had a, a linear transformation on a four dimensional space, right? Yeah. We could talk about that. If we have a four real dimensional space, then the complexification is on four complex dimensions, right? What if we had, say, a, um, so we, we could have like a complex eigenvalue repeated, you know, but only have one complex eigenvector for the complexification. In that case, we would end up needing to look at, you know, well, let me just write it out. So theorem. If T uh, is a mapping from V to V uh, with the dimension in the real sense of V being 4, and we have lambda equals to alpha um, plus I beta with beta not equals to 0, and the dimension, um, uh, multiplicity 2, I should say, in the algebraic sense, right? So just to be clear, I'm saying that the characteristic polynomial of T could be written as, you know, like S minus alpha quantity squared plus beta squared squared, all right? We have all this um, such that the um, dimension in the complex sense of the um, lambda eigenspace 
is equal to 1, all right, uh, then um, there exists, uh, uh, well, let's say v1 and there exists v1 and v2 um, in the complexification of v for which, for, what, what am I doing? I was, I was starting which with a c, I think it makes sense. Um, for which um, we could do like delta equals to say v1 um, comma v2 comma v1 conjugate and v2 conjugate is a pair of uh, two chains. So in particular, I'm saying t uh, minus lambda, you guys will correct me here in a second, times uh, v2 is equal to v1, and t minus lambda conjugate of v2 conjugate is equal to v1 conjugate. Uh. And that is why I won't take your points. Let's see here, very good. Yes, the sub C, thank you. Exactly my point. And I'm, I would not be surprised if you comb through my notes and you can find places where I am not, you know, subject to my own legalism. Do you get extra credit when you find You get the satisfaction of knowing that you're smarter than I am on that point in the notes. You get the satisfaction of knowing that I was wrong. That's got to be worth something, right? <coughs> You're like, well, that's the kind of low-hanging fruit. Hey, that's not nice. Why do you say that? Okay, I said that. But anyway, so the, the point here is if that's the case, the matrix of uh, T sub C with respect to the delta basis would be what? It's, you know, it's, it's the usual thing. It's lambda 1, 0, lambda, and then lambda conjugate 1, lambda conjugate zero, and the other blocks are zero, okay? So, so far I have said nothing terribly interesting except that, hey, you could look at the Jordan form in the case that the geometric multiplicity is one. If the algebraic multiplicity is two, it must be that there's a generalized eigenvector of order two sitting there waiting for you to find for each eigenvalue, of which there are two and they're distinct given that beta is not zero. But what's perhaps more interesting is let, you know, V1 equal to A1 plus IB1 and V2 equals to A2 plus IB2. And then we can look at if we form a basis for the original four dimensional space by A1, B1, A2, B2, we can look at what's the matrix look like for that, you know? So we're going to like form gamma, let's say, equal to A1, B1, A2, B2 um, for V. And you can prove that these are linearly independent. I don't feel like doing it at the moment. That seems like a good test question. Yeah? No? It's got to be kind of like that chain independence we worked out the other day. But how would I figure out the matrix of T gamma gamma? What do I need to do? figure out the matrix of T gamma gamma, I need to figure out, you know, like what's the coordinate vector of T of A1, right? What's the coordinate vector of T of uh, B1? What's the coordinate vector of um, T of uh, A2? I hope I put these in the right order. Um, and what's the coordinate vector of T of B2? Yeah, I think I did. Well, if I put them in the wrong order, we just won't get the, it won't, it won't be wrong, it just won't be the Jordan form, all right? So, look here, we have T of, um, T of V1 equals to lambda V1. We have T of V2 is equal to lambda V2 plus V1, right? Those are the chain conditions. Did I write them down anywhere? Oh, yeah, I did. Here, right? At this point, admonish me. Thank you. 
Very good. I'm starting to feel like a good custom in here is to not write the C. But then I can't take points off students. There's no fun in that, right? So <laughs> explicitly then, this gives us T of A1. I'll just skip a step here. T of A1 plus, you can take 20% of my credit. Um, T, I, T of B1 is equal to, you know, A plus, my bad, alpha plus I beta times A1 plus IB1, right? And this, of course, will give me T of A2 plus I T of B2 is equal to, well, alpha plus I beta times A2 plus I B2 uh, plus A1 plus I B1. So work that out. What do we get? Same calculation we just did over there, right? So we've got ourselves a alpha A1 minus beta B1 plus I times uh, beta A1 plus alpha uh, B1. And then down here, we've got ourselves a alpha A2 minus beta B2 um, plus I times uh, beta A2 uh, plus alpha B2. And of course, still plus, plus your uh, lovely A1 plus IB1 floating out here, right? There we go, now we can read off the matrix. We can read off the matrix, let's do it. You guys excited? No? No? Okay, yeah, yeah, fine. Well, I, I think it's interesting, I think it's interesting. I Let's see here, T gamma gamma is equal to, so from this, so we, we do the same thing we did before, right? We have two complex equations, we get two, real, we get two real equations for each, which means we get four real equations, which is good news, because we need four equations, right? So we've got this guy is equal to that, this is that, that tells me columns one and two of the matrix, right? So. So my column one is what? It's just the same as we did for the two by two case, right? You got yourself an alpha minus beta and then zero and zero. Then next up, we've got ourselves a beta and an alpha and a zero and a zero. See, because there's no, there's no A2, B2 in those two, right? In T of A1 and T of B2. T B1. There's no A1, there's no A2 and B2. Now next up, we have this is equal to that, and T of B2 is equal to all of this. Oh, my bad. I, I, yeah, my color coding's not quite right. So double, 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 single, <laughs> right? So you, you gotta be careful because T of A2 picks up this piece, but also that piece. Now that piece, the A1, what's that do? So a, T of A2 determines column three, right? So for column three, we got ourselves a, a lonely one right up here. Right there, right? And then alpha minus beta. And then finally, the double bar, T of, B, T of B2, which is the fourth column. We got ourselves a beta um, alpha down here in the lower spot. And we've got a one with the B1 spot, which is, wait a minute, what? Oh yeah, the second one. So let's put the one right here. There you go. This is by definition, 
R4 of alpha plus I beta. This is the 4x4 four four real Jordan block. A 4x4 four four real Jordan block means that the complexification has a pair of conjugate two chains. But notice that we only needed to know one of the conjugate, one of the chains to set this up, right? You see how that works? Like we only used A1 and B1, A2 and B2, we didn't even use the, the V conjugate. And we didn't need to either because it's the same data. You see that? Like the complex conjugates got the same real vectors and imaginary, ve like the real and imaginary parts are just the same. Do you maybe see where this pattern's going? I don't know, maybe not. If we had a, what if we had a six dimensional transformation, if you can imagine such a thing, and we had a, a pair of conjugate three chains with eigenvalue lambda, right? We do the same calculation essentially and what we would get is, in that case, we would get what we would call R6 of alpha plus I beta. And that looks like alpha minus beta, beta, probably should give this thing a name, right? Um, beta alpha, alpha beta minus beta alpha, alpha beta minus beta alpha um, and this this you know the calculation goes just like it did before for that part but here this ends up being zero when you sort through it and you get the one zero here that's what the six by six real Jordan block looks like. If you were to have the misfortune of having a linear transformation on a six dimensional real space and it had a complex eigenvalue three peated and yet there was only one complex eigenvector and it's conjugate, right? If that was the case, this is what the real Jordan form for your matrix looks like. Now there's a way of capturing these formulas more elegantly and that uses something called the tensor product. So I'll write it like a so. So here's what it looks like. R2k alpha plus I beta, we can write as R2 of alpha plus I beta tensor with the k by k identity matrix plus the k by k identity matrix tensored with the nilpotent element of order k that we've talked about before. Now you might be wondering what on earth I mean by that. I don't know if I even have a definition of tensor in the notes. Uh, I think I just illustrate by example pretty much. So. Um, let me erase this and write it up here. So like, you see what we got here? This is R, um, I'll get out of the way here in a second, R, R2, right? I'm going to go back to lambda if you guys don't mind. R2, <coughs> R2 lambda, right? R2 lambda, it's that matrix, you see that? Plus what? Um, the matrix, what, it's um, 0, 0, 0, and then there's just N2 up here, as we call it, yeah? Excuse me, that's not N2, is it? What is that? I2. That's I2, yeah. So here's the way this works. This is I2 tensored with 0, 1, 0, 0. And this one, on the other hand, is um, R2, I think, right? Tensored with z uh, 1, 0, 0, 1. 
So the way it works is, let me see, let me if I can give you a general definition. If I have like matrix A tensor with matrix B, the way that works for us is we do like a big matrix where what we have is like B11 A, B12 A, <laughs> and so forth and so on. Eventually down here, like B, let's say, ah, good grief, um, I guess MM um, A. So if, if, if A is N by N and B is M by M, the tensor product, or this is also sometimes called the Kronecker product. Tensor product is often used for something that's a little bit more abstract. Like this is a concrete matrix operation that you're learning today. Um, I don't think I talked about this in 221, did I? No, I had the good sense not to talk about it there. Um, so it gives you a new MN by MN matrix. This is yet another way of multiplying matrices, but this time you're making a bigger matrix. But it's super useful when you have like slick patterns like this. See, because you see what this is? You've got the, the R2, the R2 lambda, the R2 lambda on the diagonal. So you can get that by just doing, you know, you just want to put an R2 lambda everywhere there's one of them and there's just one of them where? Wherever the identity is, right? Non zero. So that puts chunk, chunk, chunk. That, that builds this piece, this piece, this piece. And then I'm putting the identity matrix a couple places, right? So the two by two identity matrix, and I'm, I'm putting it where? I'm putting it in this block and in that block. So if you use your imagination, you can see that that's And you should recognize this is the so-called N3. N3 such that N3 squared is non-zero, but N3 cubed is zero. It's the quintessential nil, nil potent matrix of order three. Yeah. I thought that was N2. I wouldn't square it to make it easier. No, N, N2, N3 squared is just, oh, right. no. yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's the, uh, this guy. Whew, you had me worried. <laughs> Don't do that. And so here is the general Jordan block, right? So, which matrix, which you know, which tra which real transformation can we put into um, to real Jordan form? Like which real ma which real transformations allow? for finding a real Jordan form. Let me put it a different way. Is there any real transformation which doesn't allow for a real Jordan form? No. See, because we can always complexify it, and the complexification always has all of the eigenvalues because the complex numbers are algebraically closed, right? They're every complex polynomial completely factors. As such, we can always find a Jordan basis for the complexification, and because of the structure, they have to come in conjugate pairs. Of cha the chains have to have a conjugate pairing structure. So you'll have to be able to have half of your Jordan chains. If you take the complex conjugate of them, you get the other half for the complexification's Jordan form. And then if we rip off the real and imaginary parts of those chains and build those in the systematic way I've showed you, this defines what's called the real Jordan form of the matrix. Yep. Right, yeah, I, I should, fair enough. So like the, the duplication I'm talking about is only for the complex eigenvectors. True enough, if we had a real, if we had like a real eigenvalue in the midst of this, it would just behave like usual, right? That doesn't have to come with the pairing, obviously. Only for the complex eigenvalues do we get the pairing 
We could also have like, we could, generally we'll have a mixture, right? We'll have some real eigenvectors with real eigenvalues and we'll have some complex conjugate pairs for a real transformation. But the union of those two things has to give us what we call a real Jordan basis. And the transformations matrix with respect to a real Jordan basis will be a direct sum of the real Jordan blocks we looked at before, you know, J whatever, J1, J2, J3, whatever you need of the real eigenvalues. And then also with the direct sum of these real Jordan blocks. What are these geometrically? Like the fundamental one, the R2, wherever it was, if you look at that, what that is actually is a rotation dilation. You can rewrite that as a rotation times a rescaling. So that's, that's what the real Jordan blocks are doing geometrically. They're not, they're, they're no eigenvector in the real sense because they take vectors and they, they, they stretch them out and then they rotate them, right? That's never, not, that's not usually going to be back in the same direction as the vector to start with. That's why there's no real eigenvector. It's because that part of the real transformation corresponds to like a rotation dilation. But of course, the eigenvector part just corresponds to stretching it out along those directions. I don't have a good way to explain the generalized eigenvector. What's that geometrically? I don't know. You guys can explain it to me. I'd be happy. I don't know what to say about that. I don't have a quick thing to say there. I mean, but they're out there. They're there. So listen, next time, I'll show you how we can use all this to solve every differential equation known to man. So <laughs> yeah, but anyway, that's pretty much it for the uh, Jordan stuff. Um, oh, I have your homework to give back to you, so I'll do that. <laughs>